we have to talk about one of the most egregious examples of right-wing overreach that we've seen in a long while now. Um, and that's SB8 here in Texas. And, and I think that people who have been saying things like this in the past day uh, are correct that um, you know, this is a moment where you're, you are seeing Roe v. Wade um, evaporate in front of your own eyes. And we'll get to the Supreme Court and all the problems in a moment. I just want to say up top, um, you know, this is this is a very real threat. This is not culture war BS. This is a very serious threat to people's lives, to people's dignity, um, and 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 to women's rights all across, obviously Texas, but the country as well. And we need to take this threat extremely seriously. For people who aren't familiar with the way that this law works and why it's so insidious, um, is that you know it's essentially a ban on abortions past six weeks. For people who aren't familiar with this kind of stuff, that is a period of time that is so short that the vast majority of people would miss um, any signs that they were pregnant. So they would already be outside of that window making any kind of attempt to access healthcare illegal for them. But what is so sinister about this bill, and it, it, it truly shows how long this fight has been going on and how long this attempt from the right wing has been going on, how methodical this bill is, um, you know, and we'll get to that kind of long arc of, of, of politics around abortion in a second. But um, the way that this bill is enforced is it encourages private citizens to sue women and abortion providers and, um, and that, and also entices them with a financial reward for doing so, right? So instead of it being the state making these suits against people, it is individuals, private individuals who have nothing to do um, with that person, um, nothing to do with the organizations that are providing abortions, and everything to do with turning this state and turning our society and our community into a constant protracted social war. And that's something that the Republicans have become very skilled at, uh, as we'll get to in a little bit with the masks and, and, and Matt. But, um, you know, like they have found a way to turn society, community into a, into a space where you suspect your neighbors. Right. You're prepared for conflict constantly. Um, and, and in this case, I mean, it's extreme and egregious. I just yeah, I can't get over that uh, to stay the surveillance community surveillance sort of deputizing everybody as bounty hunters for anyone who might not only get an abortion, but aid in a bet, like a mm -hmm. cab driver or a friend, um, like helping somebody go absolutely like dystopian. It's chilling. And, and, you know, just in the aftermath, it, you know, I, I won't name names because everybody's reacting and trying to find the best way to make sure that they're safe and that they're able to be able to provide for people in the future. But it has been sort of chilling to see some of these organizations that advocate uh, for women's rights having, uh, you know, notes on the front page of their website saying, you know, we actually can't perform any services um, for the next two weeks while we like we, uh, you know, recalculate what our strategy is. Right. This is, um, you know, it, it, it's a very chilling thing. And one I, I will say is that it's it's shocking to folks because. Everyone saw this law for what it was, which was a completely unconstitutional and illegal law, right? And people had a hope that the Supreme Court would intervene, and they didn't. They didn't even hear the case. It's not even that the Supreme Court ruled one way or another. They refused to hear a case on this. Now, it should be said, it could potentially happen in the future. It has been thrown out or anything like that. But by refusing to see to hear this, they have now allowed this to become the law in the state of Texas. Um, I just, I, I just, I, I can only try as much as possible to convey the seriousness and the weight of this moment. Um, and, uh, what we can do here is sort of try to understand why we're in this present situation. We'll get to that in just one moment, but I do want to throw in some, some positive, um, ideas, right. Or at least hope. There are a lot of incredible organizations here in Texas. You know, Lilith Fund is, is one. We'll put a link to places that people can donate um, and look to help out to in the show notes um, in a little bit. But I want to remind people um, what fills me with pride and hope and to be honest, a bit of fear is the realization and the truth 
um, of talking to people who have been fighting so hard in this state and all across the country to make sure that these rights don't get eroded, that people are going to challenge this and people are going to fight this and people are going to put themselves and their communities and their organizations and their families at risk to make sure that people's basic fundamental human rights are not infringed upon. And you can never be guaranteed of a victory, but I do know with the tenacity and, and the power of these people who have been fighting here in Texas, that there will be um, a, a victory. And we just have to do as much as we can to try to help and support folks. So remember that it's okay to take a second and be like, okay, this is overwhelming and, and a very dangerous moment. Uh, but also remember that there are extremely fucking brave people out there who are willing to put a law on the line. Yeah. Do you want to get to some of the recrimination now? How do you mean? I, oh, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. How do we how do we get here? <laughs> Sorry. I just like I was at the I was at a huge rally, um, you know, a month or so ago here. And it was just it was really powerful to realize that, you know, there are people who who are fearless. Um, so, yeah, let me just give a second to like because we should be fucking mad. And like in moments like this, it's like you have to realize what's at stake. And this is why I've been so sick of listening to a certain kind of Democrat over the years, you know, droll on about how every election, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Right. Um, you know, and then, and then whenever anybody comes into power, a, a kind of refusal to do anything concrete about it. I've seen people, you know, rightfully take to task Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer for, you know, almost immediately put out a statement. We're going to fight as hard as possible. And yeah. We know where were they, um, you know, a week ago when people were warning that this was a problem. Um, for sure. But let's start with um, the first and foremost problem here, and that's the Supreme Court. And I can't litigate our entire you know, argument against that organization. We've done a lot of videos on it, but I'll tell you this right here and now. This was always in the cards. This was always in the cards. The Supreme Court's history, as much as the, the people who love and defend it like to say that it defends the minority from the tyranny of the majority, <laughs> it does not do that. Look at its damn history and you'll learn. The minority uh, only ever means wealthy and property The holders. minority <laughs> only means wealthy you know, and patriarchal powers. I mean, just give me a break on this shit. And even and people are saying, well, what are you talking about, David? What about Roe v. Wade, right? What about the thing that is challenged? What, what, what was the historical context of Roe v. Wade? Mass movements demanding that this right, that women's right to have uh, to health care would not be infringed by a bunch of patriarchal Christian assholes. Right. All across this country, abortion was becoming legalized because of this mass mobilization, these grassroots organizations, these people fighting in the streets to make sure that these rights were not infringed. Roe v. Wade comes in and it basically put everything on pause and made abortions legal in the country, not from any kind of radical sense of saying like well, women fundamentally as human beings have the right to control their own bodies and right to healthcare. It, it came to it from an extremely conservative um, uh, avenue, right? Saying because of the right to privacy, blah, blah, right? The point here is that Roe v. Wade comes in and yeah, you know, it's a victory when it happens. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it puts this thing over our head forever, that if ever the Supreme Court's makeup changed enough, that it could be struck down um, and, and overruled, right? It never settled the question. And it's always been used since then by both the Democrats and the Republicans to try to rile up and shore up support, um, probably in communities where they wouldn't be able to, to win it in the first place, right? It's always made this a, a very... Um, you know, a ticking time bomb ready to go off. Right. So when people would make those arguments about the Supreme Court, for example, in, in 2016 to folks, um, you know, you, you would have to remind them that's like, well, this problem goes much deeper than just one election. We can't be living in a situation where we're, you know, one of the two parties losing a presidential election at any time could mean utter disaster for women's health care in this country. Yeah, I mean, I think. And it's to specifically blame um, people for not being on the ball, particularly voters, I think is just insane, particularly when the actual leadership of the party is not having people like Ruth Bader Ginsburg step down and do the bare minimum yeah. of what they need to do to fix this problem. Um, and that's really like, I mean, this is true in all sorts of contexts. Like you can't, there's nothing fruitful to blame the, the regular voter. Uh, it, it's so revealing of a type of politics, I think. 
we're, but it's also an absurd way to try to run a democracy too, right? Where like everything is always in threat in the sense too, where it's like, okay, all of these things are always like directly under threat, but we don't really have any kind of other democratic avenues where we can implement radical change, right? It was always a kind of defensive posture, which we talk about a lot, why a lot of people are pessimistic about politics, right? It's like things people are taught, are like taught this from the beginning that politics is only going to make things worse, right? And at best, maybe make sure that, you know, basically stop it from from getting any worse there. Um, Yeah, look, I mean, you know, National Democrats for sure should have made this a priority. They could have been, um, you know, working and using their majorities that they have to start implementing uh, protections for folks. I'll tell you one thing that state and local governments across this country have been working overtime, even when they're out of power, to make sure that once, you know, a Roe v. Wade decision is overturned, then, you know, abortion will be made illegal in those states. Texas is one of those. I don't know if you have anything else on the on the national Dems, uh, unless because I wanted to say some things about Texas in particular. Um, have at it. I just in, in Texas, um, what's so frustrating about this moment um, is that since the GOP, since the Republicans came up with a very similar uh, kind, at least in the sense of like it was it was bold and had like a, a lot of strategy behind it. A strategy to flip the state of Texas from being a Democratic Party stronghold to something that now people think it's possible for Democrat to win statewide office, right? There has been no counter strategy since. It's almost been decades now of just constant bleeding. And I'm going to tell you the two main factors here are this bullshit hope that demographics are destiny, right? And par- primarily what that means for the Democratic Party is that they think that they have a captured voting block in the state of Texas, Black people and Hispanic people. And all that we have seen um, in the past few years, and specifically in 2016 and made much worse in 2020, is that people aren't going to show up for you if you don't provide for them. Uh, you know, Jessica Cisneros, after the, the 2020 debacle here in the state of Texas, and if people aren't familiar with politics here, I, I understand. Um, but, you know, just a quick primer, like there were a lot of, there's a shitload of big talk here in 2020 that the Democrats were going to not only maybe win with Biden at the top of the ticket, oh, but they were definitely going to flip the legislature, right? And in fact, they not only didn't flip the legislature, they lost seats, Right. And um, and they lost vote share in the in the Rio Grande Valley um, in communities they, they should never should have been losing votes in. Um, and, and someone like Jessica Cisneros was coming and, and, and she tweeted this out after the, the fallout I said, I was calling up the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, headquarters and saying, we got to do something in this part of the country. We have to start showing up for um, Tejanos and and Hispanic Texans. Um, And they were met with silence. Instead, a double down on this strategy that you're going to be able to pry away suburban voters from the Republican Party. And while you might be able to, to do that, and we saw that that was one of the fascinating things about the Biden strategy. There is a definite ceiling in the state of Texas for suburban voters that you're going to be able to pull away. And also, if you are supposed to be the party that's supposed to be standing up, we all know the Democratic Party is a complete disaster and isn't actually this. But that's how they brand themselves as the party of you know, a multiracial working class coalition. Um, and every moment when it comes down, down to doing politics, they abandon those people. Um, you know, there's no excuse for them to be losing votes um, in that part of, 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 the, of the state. The suburban strategy is a failure, not just like electorally in the sense of like, oh, I'm a you know, pundit or somebody work, trying to make the Democratic Party strong. It's a failure for the history um, of, of this country and the history of, of Texas in particular, because it opens up these doors for stronger and stronger GOP majorities to allow them to do this kind of damage. Um, there's n- you know, the fact is, is that do not let the Democratic Party and the Texas State Democratic Party with the leaders that it has today use this to raise a shitload of money and then to maintain the same strategy that they've been doing that got us into the situation in the first place. And that has been one of the most frustrating things that I've been seeing today. It's a bunch of people out there demanding that like, oh, we just need to trust the people who got us into this nightmare more and give them more money and show up more. No, these people need to be kicked out of their positions. And if there's any kind of future for, uh, you know, um, for for a different kind of politics here, there needs to be a different kind of political leadership in the state of Texas. And it needs to be much more representative of the working class uh, base of this state instead of this kind of suicidal 
tilt and bent to trying to become the party of wealthy suburbs, um, not just in Texas, but across the, the damn country, but specifically in this moment, Texas, because this is what you get. You get a lot of people upset, a lot of people hurt, um, and nobody to lead us out of it other than maybe donating more money to the Democratic National Committee, right? Yeah. Um, there's no quick solution. There's no donor base to answer this problem. It's the high time for the corporate wing of the party to get out of the way. They don't know what's happening in the rest of Texas, and they refuse to listen to all of us who have been trying to warn them for a long ass time. No, it's absolutely a, a national abdication or abdication when you look at the stories saying we're going to out organize voter suppression uh, in yeah. the future, right? <laughs> what the fuck? Well, what that means, I mean, think about who's really hurt by voter suppression. And you look, you need to look at these parties, particularly like the corporate wings of them, as collaborationist. Um, mm -hmm. And they they don't mind a uh, electorate that swings back and forth enough as long as poor, more poor people are cut out of it. And I have to say this, there's no doubt that dealing with voter suppression in Texas is something that has to happen, right? It's just like, that's just a basic, that's just like, do you have morals or not have morals, right? But this kind of fantasy that some of the people in the Democratic Party have been trying to make about Texas, right, is that, oh, well, Texas isn't, a the slogan has always been like, Texas isn't a, isn't a Republican state, it's like a low voting state, right? Um, you had historic levels of voting in 2020, and they weren't able um, to, to get the kind of results that they wanted. And like, look, right. don't get me wrong. There's a lot of gerrymandering and all this kind of things. Yeah. Um, but this kind of like, we're just going to sit on our hands and like, we're just going to be delivered victories attitude that a lot of people have had in, in Texas. And honestly, the demographics is destiny argument is like, that's all across the country, but they love it here. Um, cause you know, there's, there's no self-reflection needed, right? It's just going to happen someday. We're learning and we're seeing in real time that that's not going to work and the results are disastrous for us. Yeah. And it's interesting. There's a new book um, that came out actually by an academic that like even the academics are like, yeah, this this whole thing we did about um, the uh, Demo there's a literal book called them like mm -hmm. I it was and it's it's didn't turn out to be so fixed. Well, I mean, it, it's it's also rude and essentialist too. I have exactly to that's the problem. Well, I'm sorry, like I, I hate to you know to to be glib about this, but there is just no cheat code to politics and this kind of idea that some liberals have had that like things are just going to sort of materialize for them. You know, maybe it's just because we're socialists, for example, and we've learned that like you know the working class of the world is not just going to like rise on their own. Um, that like we sort of are you know maybe a little bit inoculated against this kind of like fixation that you don't have to do strategy, you don't have to do organizing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's 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 just it's got to stop. Man. <laughs> Because at the end of the day, it's like you have to understand that people are people and that there are ways for our opponents to make inroads with communities, even if you don't, even if you might think it's absurd, right? There are ways for Republicans to make inroads with the Hispanic and Tejano community in Texas. There are ways for them to make inroads with the Black community um, in Texas and all across the country, right? We have to be stopping that from happening. And the only way to stop that from happening is to be providing for people and showing them something different.